Well, if you have been uh, reading along, we finished the Psalms, which means that we're more than halfway through our Bible reading. Um, if you haven't been reading along or you fell behind, there's no reason to feel discouraged about that. We're going to be uh, moving right along. Just grab one of the little markers that's in the bulletin there. Pick up where it's convenient for you to start and join us as we enter into uh, the letters of the New Testament and the prophets. Those would be great places to start. So no worry if you haven't been reading along, but hopefully if you have, um, it has been a blessing to you. Um, there's something I want us to think about this morning for a little bit in our time together. Uh, the text that we're going to start with, though, was not in our reading this week. I think it's pretty familiar to you, but I think uh, it's good for us to have sort of a, a bigger picture as we look at some pieces from our reading this week. And so um, these words should sound very familiar to you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, so do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. These words from Jesus were brought to my mind as I was reading this week, both in the accounts in Acts of Paul, in his time in Jerusalem, his arrest, the plot to end his life, and his appearance before the rulers and governors. I'll explain how my brain connects that in a minute, but I was also reminded of it as I was reading, and you'll have to forgive me for this, the very boring genealogies. I just get bored. As the beginning of Chronicles tells all these names and all these people. Now, I know I was taught in school. I, w I know that the genealogies are important, Bill. I know. But I'm an American. And I have been raised to believe it doesn't matter where you come from, who your parents were, or what they did, you can decide who you want to be. And so the genealogies are hard for me because I have to tell you that's not how ancient people think. That's new. That's a relatively new invention, this idea of personal choice and destiny. And so as we think about the 4th of July, I don't know if you ever think about that, but that's what's unique. You decide who you want to be. But in reading the prophets, well, that idea is a little foreign. 
to these people. Certainly in the book of Chronicles, as it begins to unfold the story of how we ended up where we ended up, with kings and chronicles trying to call the people of God, of Israel, of Judah, back to their senses of who they were called to be. These genealogies are important. These people who repeat the same cycle over and over again, every time they get a new king, it seems they haven't learned the lesson. And the genealogies remind us of this as we unfold this story, and we see these names again and again, and you're supposed to recall the story of their life. So when you see Judah's name, you're supposed to remember, actually, he wasn't that great of a guy. He had to be tricked in order to do what was right. That's this strange message of the genealogies. And then occasionally, you get these little verses sprinkled in. But they were unfaithful to the God of their fathers and prostituted themselves to the gods of the people of the land whom God had destroyed before them. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Paul, king of Assyria, that is, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, who took the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh into exile. And this is the story of Chronicles. But those words of Jesus kept popping into my head. That when you focus on the kingdom of God, and you don't worry about life and what things will happen tomorrow or the next day, but focus on the kingdom of God. And those genealogies point to this bigger story. And it would seem that Paul learned, somehow his brain was able to envision that he was living in the middle of one of those genealogy stories. That he had been fighting against the kingdom of Jesus the kingdom of God, and that he was standing in that moment of his name and the name that would come next, and would he learn the lesson. And so he, con he continued to follow after Jesus, rejecting everything that had been brought about before. Paul, in that moment on that road, encountered the ultimate promise of God, the Messiah. And he was blinded before, and then he could see. This is uh, described this way in Acts chapter 22, where he tries to tell the story of how he became a follower of Jesus. And these words were spoken to him when he was blinded. The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Paul became an ambassador of this message of Jesus, that the Messiah has arrived and that forgiveness is present in him and that one can be saved through faith in Jesus and obedience become part of the body of Christ. And Paul devotes his entire life to proclaiming that message. It was his belief that God was no longer wanting to simply work through the nation of Israel, but specifically wanting to work through Jesus Christ to bless all nations. The promise, actually, that all the prophets are going to try to unfold for us as we enter that period of our reading. They're going to try to describe how through the Messiah and the work of Jesus, as we believe that's fulfilled, is a calling to all people of all nations, to all of humanity come under the banner of the Messiah of Jesus. And Paul believed that he was living in that moment where it transitioned away from simply a restoration of the Jewish people to the reign of a Messiah who now meant to extend his dominion to all people in all nations. He had an overwhelming belief that God was doing what he had always promised. And that through Israel, yes, through David, God would reveal himself to all people, all nations, all tribes, and lead everyone to bow down before, as the passage we read calls him, the righteous one. 
and that all people would hear this righteous one speak and that they would all know God through Jesus. And so Paul is living in the middle of one of those genealogical stories. That through Jesus, we would be born again, remade. I know it's easier for our brain to process when we, when we say Jesus is the Son of God the Father. That's easier for our brain to process. That describes, and we like the description, that Jesus is our brother. We become brothers and sisters of Christ. But Scripture also paints a slightly different picture of that. One that's important if you're going to learn from the exile. That we are actually children of Jesus. That's a harder picture for us because we're so used to the other one. But Scripture definitely paints the idea that we are captives of Christ. That we are a conquered people. That we are slaves to Jesus. Right? You've heard that. But the idea isn't that you're just slaves. You're not slaves anymore. See, you've been a captured people. You have been defeated and you're the spoils of war. That, not a war against you, but a war against sin and death. That had you, you belong to sin and death. And Jesus has conquered sin and death and taken you captive. And you are now his slave, but not a slave because he's done this remarkable thing. He has adopted you. He has made you his child. And the reason for that, you see, this conquering Messiah and King has claimed you and said you are his heir so that you may inherit his kingdom. See, you know that picture. We just don't describe it that way. We're so familiar with the other way we describe it that we forget to hang on to this, this image of this conquering king who now leads his captives and gives them gifts. And that picture is going to be painted really profoundly for us as we enter into reading the New Testament letters. But we are all descendants of Jesus. And now you're in the genealogy too. But through Jesus. He's the one who brings you in. You are a child adopted brought into the story. You are included in the lineage of God's promise to Israel because of Jesus. And what about that reading in Matthew, though? Why did it keep popping into my head? How does it connect with some boring genealogies? And Paul standing before some governor trying to convince him of some truth. This Benjamite, a Pharisee, who by his own admission multiple times says that he agreed, he agreed with putting to death all those who followed Jesus. That he stood in judgment of those who accepted the testimony of Jesus. And now this transition at the end of the book of Acts do you ever wonder what Paul thought as he put his head down each night in a prison cell? Do you ever wonder if he wondered if it was worth it? If he'd made the right choice? Not simply to believe in Jesus, but do you remember in the story how many people are like, dude, going to Jerusalem's a bad idea? No, I have to go, he said. Do you ever wonder if he went, maybe those guys were right? And he wondered if it was worth it. Do you ever wonder about those disobedient people that you've been reading about? Man, those guys are so dumb. They don't pay attention. They don't learn their lessons. They don't hold on to the truth and the promise. Do you ever wonder what those kings thought as they drew their last breath? What about those people who only realize what the prophets mean as they realize what the prophets mean. And the enemy is standing at their gate. And
and they turn to one another and say, I know what Jeremiah meant. We're not going to survive this. Do you ever wonder what they thought? And how about you? Do you ever wonder about the suffering in your life? Why things happen the way they happen? Did you read these words this week as we started the Psalms over again? O oh Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. Salah. But you are a shield around me, O Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. Salah. I lie down and sleep. I wake up again, because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Arise, O Lord. Deliver me, O oh my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Salah. I read those. We usually skip them. Did you notice I said Salah? Count how many times I did it. I want you to remember that for just a moment. I want you to hold on to it three times. I wonder if Paul, who had probably memorized all of the Old Testament, said those words to himself as he went to sleep in a prison cell. I wonder if the people surrounded by their enemies as they gathered in their city strongholds, surrounded by the vast army of Babylon, said these words. But more important are the words that we read at the beginning, the words spoken by the one who has taken us captive. And I want to remind you of his words again. O you of little faith, so do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The people of God those who have been taken captive and claimed for the kingdom of the Son, those he has called, they are to believe on Jesus. That was the message of Paul. Believe on Jesus. Strange phrasing, on. Not in, on. Believe on Jesus. And you're supposed to believe on Jesus even in the midst of hardship and pain. For his will has not been completed yet. See, I think that's what Paul believed. He had this promise from God. He had this promise from Jesus. I love it in Acts when red letters show up. It means Jesus is still working, still speaking. And he had this promise, you will testify. You will. And so Paul believed that life was not over yet, even though it was filled with hardship and suffering. In his darker moments, I think, Paul probably did wonder, at least when will this end? Hopefully, he didn't struggle with why. Because he held on to a simple truth. That through his hardship, God is glorified. That's a hard message for us to hang on to in a world filled with a lot of suffering and pain. That somehow, 
even in our hardships, God can be glorified. And that by looking at the kingdom of God, not our kingdom, that's where I think the people in Judah and Israel went wrong. They kept thinking of the kingdom as theirs, not God's. And so they lost sight of the blessing of God that he was trying to pronounce through them and bring to life through them. And for all of us, just as Jesus reminds us in that text from Matthew, if we're looking at the kingdom of God, then all these things are going to be added. I should mention that word is added, not you have. It doesn't mean you have everything you need. It just means it's coming. And that was what the people of Israel had to hold on to in the middle of exile. It's coming. It's not present. And in the midst of suffering, we have to hold that same mindset. That we have every blessing we need in Jesus. It's at least promised to us. It may not be in our hands right now. The safety and security that we long for. The peace the freedom from enemies that surround us, and certainly Paul for two years, where we left him in the story, for two years, sat in a prison cell, waiting for the promise of God to be real. And just like these people who are going into exile that we're going to read about, the prophets as they speak, as we read and unfold the story of Chronicles, of a people who are, have been exiled, who are now returning home and need to find their way. We're not home yet. We're still waiting for God to deliver. Three times. Salah. Like I said, we never read those words. Do you know what it means? Lots of people uh, argue about what they mean. Some people think they're like a musical note. But they're an instruction. So if we take all the meanings that everybody argues about, we come up with three, which is convenient for me and my three. Pause. Reflect. Breathe. In the midst of suffering and hardship in your life, God invites you to pause. It means give yourself a minute to look around. Reflect. Is this what I think God is doing? Is this of God? Is this God's will? To actually begin to ask some reflective questionings. If it is God's will, why? What do I think he's trying to ultimately accomplish? Paul, it was easy. He had that promise, you will testify about me in Rome. And so he could hold on. I'm not in Rome yet. But in your life, what is God trying to accomplish? And hopefully the words of Jesus can at least bring you some comfort. That if you're focused on the kingdom, then God is trying to glorify the kingdom of the Son through you. And how would you embrace that? And then when you reflect for that moment and think, how can God use this moment to bring glory to himself? Now take a breath. I'm always reminded of that passage to the prophet. You're not strong enough for the journey. So you better breathe. You better take a breath. But my favorite thing, do you remember what you have been given? Not just the hope of eternity, right? The promise of going to heaven. Do you remember what you've been given? Not a trick question. I'm waiting for someone. Do you know what you've been given? What is it? Yes? We say it. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the... Holy Spirit, his name is breath. That's his name. The breath of God has been given to you to sustain you, 
because you are not strong enough for the journey on your own. Good thing he didn't leave you. And he sustains you with the breath of God. God breathes in you. And you have more power at your disposal than you can possibly imagine to sustain you for whatever journey you face, whatever hardship or struggle. And so when suffering and hardship come into your life, remember three. Pause. Reflect. Breathe. Because God brings victory. That's what God does. In his time, he brings victory. And the challenge of God's people are to always hold on, always hold on to the hope that we have in Jesus that when he says something, it will be so. It will be. And so we hold on and we claim the victory of Jesus over whatever circumstance we face. Now, as we finish this morning, I've mentioned it already, we're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Paul mentioned it too in his, in his preaching, his teaching to Felix and Festus and Agrippa. What was he waiting for? As he recounts the story. I heard the righteous one speak. I knew that Jesus was the Messiah, and so he was invited to do something. What was he waiting for? Get up. Be baptized. Call upon the one who saves and sustains. To receive the gift of not only forgiveness of sin, but the Holy Spirit of God to sustain you. If you have never made that profession, well, I don't know what you're waiting for. But respond to the invitation of God to become a child of God, born through the work of Jesus, made new, a captive, empowered by his spirit, claimed for the kingdom. And if you're a believer and you need the prayers of the saints, we would invite you to come. Whatever your need is, let's stand together and sing.